Are you satisfied with inconsistencies, error, or contradictions, especially when it comes to our understanding of the Bible? If you answered yes, then this teaching series is not likely going to be of any interest to you. However, if you are like most and interested in testing what you believe in your faith, if you are really interested in digging into the Word of God and only have a desire for believing and applying truth, then this teaching series should be of value, perhaps even life-changing. Every Bible teacher on the planet holds to some doctrinal error to some degree. That is a simple fact. Any honest teacher should admit the possibility or even likelihood of being in error on some things. We are fooling ourselves if we think that we have it all figured out or that anyone else has all of the answers. But should we just throw up our hands in frustration and stop trying to understand His Word better? Should we be okay with error? In the end, we will understand all things. But should that cause us to refrain from trying to understand His Word now? The Spirit that should be dwelling inside of all of us should always be motivating us to want to understand and apply the Word of God. It gives us the desire to dig into the Word, to learn it, and then practice it in our lives. When the Bible says something is true, it causes us to want to do what is true because of our faith. For instance, we believe that it is true that murder and stealing is wrong. Thus. Any believer who believes the Word of God is right about those things will choose to not do those things. Likewise, we also believe that being baptized and being honest is also true instructions found in the Bible. Thus, we practice those things because they are true. They are part of the Bible that we claim to have faith in. We believe it is true. So why would we not want to do what is true? It is faith that produces salvation, not anything that we do. Salvation is by faith, not by works. The same faith that leads to salvation also produces works. Thus, works cannot and never will have any causal relationship with our salvational status. But, just because there is no causal relationship, there is clearly a correlational effect. Our faith causes salvation, and real faith is evidenced in our works. We will explain this later in the teaching if it seems confusing at the moment. The Bible is very clear on this matter, and we want to make sure that you understand that this teaching is teaching that very same thing. There is no such thing as a works-based salvation. We are baptized, or strive to be honest, because of our salvation, because of our faith, not for our salvation. The same holds true for every commandment of God. The very same reason we are baptized, or don't murder someone, is the very same reason why we would keep any commandment of God. Doing these things is evidence that we believe these things are true. It is evidence that we believe that the Bible is true. It is evidence of our faith. Notice, though, that it is the evidence of our faith, not the cause of it. It is correlational, not causal. In other words, if we commit and trust in something, we will by default end up doing what we commit and trust in. What you believe inwardly will be observable outwardly. This is the stated purpose of the Holy Spirit. It gives us that desire to learn that truth that we will end up practicing. In many ways, many today have an unsettling feeling in their spirit because they see many things established in the Word of God as truth, yet everyone around them teaches that it is no longer truth and not to practice that truth. Perhaps that should bother us to some extent. It should make us wonder, can something that God declared to be truth for His people become not truth later? If some absolute truth can become something that is no longer truth, was it really truth to begin with? And was it really absolute? These are legitimate questions and questions that everyone should be asking. Can instructions that are called freedom in Scripture be something that God has to free us from later? Did God free us from freedom? We realize that sounds rather absurd, but believe it or not, mainstream doctrine teaches that is what God did indeed do. That same freedom is even called bondage. He supposedly freed us from His already established freedom to give us some different type of freedom found only in Christ. Somehow the freedom offered by the Father and the freedom offered by the Son are two different things and somehow contrary to one another. Is it even possible for this to make sense? Here is another question that is rather perplexing. 
God declares His law to be perfect. Yet mainstream doctrine teaches that the law of God changed and thus has been made better. So, are we to understand that perfect can be made more perfect? How can something already declared perfect be declared to be made even more perfect? How can it be made better? If these things do not concern you at all, and you are comfortable subscribing to such doctrinal understanding, then we will admit stopping this teaching now will save you some time, because we are setting out to reconcile these things. If you would like to reconcile them as well, then this teaching should be of value. Your flesh will not like the solution to these questions, but the Word of God says the Spirit dwelling inside of you will. If you are even a little concerned about some of these contradictions, then these are some of the things that we need to figure out. Everyone that has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them should always still be in the process of learning. Everyone is both a teacher and a student in some capacity. The only thing we can do, and certainly should do, is continually test ourselves and others to the Word of God. We should love correcting ourselves and being corrected, because in correction, the worst thing that can happen is that we are humbled and understand the Word of God better. Those are both two wonderful things. God says that because He loves us, He will correct us. If you feel like the Word of God used in this teaching is correcting you, then consider yourself loved by God, because that is what the Word of God does. And anyone who hates correction is foolish. It is the wise who love correction. Proverbs 12.1 Hating correction leads to our own destruction. Proverbs 15.9-10 Yahweh detests the way of the wicked, but He loves those who pursue righteousness. Stern discipline awaits anyone who leaves the path. The one who hates correction will die. Some teach that we should not correct others, but that simply makes no sense. Titus chapter 2 These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. 1 Timothy chapter 5 Them that sin, rebuke before all, that others also may fear. If you correct a wise man, you should receive nothing more than love back. A scoffer of the word of God hates correction and will hate us for it. Proverbs chapter 9 Do not correct a scoffer, lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Without the word of God, we cannot expose error. If we cannot expose error, then we cannot remove error. How much would we have to not like someone to not correct them in their error? This teaching will be a little direct sometimes, and often a little sharp as the Word of God is presented. But remember what truth does. Hebrews chapter 4. For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Remember, our heart is naturally deceitful. It is often stated by those being corrected, well, God knows my heart. Well, God does indeed know our heart. And here's what he says. Jeremiah 17. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. God wants to give us a new heart, a different heart, one that is after his commandments. Ezekiel 36. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. This is the whole point of the new covenant, to give us a desire to do the law, to place the law on our heart, not to change or abolish the law. Jeremiah 31. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my law, Torah, in their minds, and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God's instructions come from His own heart. They are for us and to be in us, changing out our heart for the heart of God. This is why God is love. And following all of God's instructions is defined as the act of love. Read all of Psalm 119. It is the longest chapter in the whole Bible. 
but it is certainly worth the read. It is obvious in reading Psalm 119 that David allowed God to give him this heart transplant. Or read Psalm 37, 31, or Psalm 40, verse 8. The law of God was evidently in David's heart. God takes out our heart and gives us his heart. It should be of no surprise, then, why David is said to be after the heart of God. Acts 13. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, and he will do everything I want him to do. We encourage you to listen what his spirit is telling you as you progress through this teaching, and also encourage you to test this teaching series to his word. So, how is it that error happens? Is it possible that anything we personally believe could be an error? How would we even know? How would we know if we were an error? Do we go by what most believe, the majority? Do we go by what the smartest people believe? Surely they would have it all figured out for us. How could so many smart people be wrong? Are smart people in large groups always going to be right? Do we go by what has historically been believed the longest? Is it even possible that God's people could have been in error for such a long period of time? Do we need to go by what beliefs have sold the most books? Or has the largest ministry? If it is popular, does it make it more right? In reality, how we know we are in error should be derived by what we place our faith in as the truth. Do we place our faith in a denominational creed as the source of truth? Do we place our faith in ongoing tradition as the source of truth? Do we place faith in our pastor or men to always give us truth? Or should we place our faith in the Word of God? That right there should be the right answer, and we should already know that. But how many times have we fallen into a position where we forget that the Word of God is the source of all wisdom and truth. It is the Word of God that is the source of truth and exposes error. The Word of God can never fail us and can never be wrong. But how can there be so many contradicting beliefs and perspectives under the same umbrella that we call faith, supposedly derived by the same Word of God? Where does all this confusion come from? God is not the author of confusion, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. In reality, the problem is us. It is always us. It has always been us. If our faith is to be in the Word of God, then the error is always the result of us misplacing our faith, because all error is against the Word of God. Error can only come from us or from others. It cannot come from the Word of God. That is how error happens, and it is the only way error happens. In fact, our flesh natively has a predisposition to do this and to want to do this. We can accidentally be in error by inadvertently misplacing our faith in men, tradition, historical standards, popular doctrine, etc., even when it is contrary to the Word of God. In fact, God's Word says that we do not need anyone to teach us. All we need is ourselves and the Spirit dwelling within us, and the Word of God. 1 John chapter 2 As for you, the anointing you have received from Him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as His anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it is taught you, remain in Him. Does that mean that teachers are not of value or that they should be avoided? No, of course not. Teachers can accelerate learning or the pointing out of error using the Word of God as the foundation. It is part of the Great Commission to teach all nations to obey everything our Savior commanded. That is mandated teaching. We are required to teach. We are required to disciple. If we are not teaching obedience to His Word, then we are simply not doing the Great Commission. The point is this. We are required to even test our teachers to the Word of God. We are accountable to what we believe based on what the Word of God teaches, not to what others taught us to believe. We are required to make sure that others are teaching us the Word of God. 
The problem is that not too much discipling is going on today. And even worse, when it is, the students are not doing their part in testing what is being taught as the Word of God. And even when teachers are teaching the Word of God, there will still be some who refuse to listen. Proverbs chapter 5. You will say, How I hated discipline. How my heart spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers or turn my ear to my instructors. This teaching could be wrong. You are required to test it. In fact, if this teaching is wrong and you know it, then there is a responsibility on you to let us know using the Word of God and correct us. Nobody should be okay with seeing a brother or sister living in error, and even worse, teaching that error to others. What love would that be? Correcting others is showing love. We are literally hating our brothers if we are not rebuking them, and we even bear their sin because of it. Sadly, the adversary exploits our fleshy predispositions and uses it to divide God's people and to nullify the Word of God. The sad part is that the flesh likes error. The flesh does not like correction. That makes a job of a teacher all the more difficult, because the only thing that overrides the flesh, the carnal, is the spirit. If the teacher's audience does not have the Spirit, there is no ear to hear. It is those after the Spirit that obey the Word of God. Those mostly driven by the flesh want less to do with the Word. And unless we test ourselves and others to the Word of God, then exposing and correcting that error is simply not possible. Unity is not possible. And all of the blessings intended for us in walking in the fullness of His truth is not possible. Until we are all mature in speaking the truth in love, unity will simply not happen. So often we hear, I think God is telling me, or God spoke to me today, or the Spirit has been leading me, etc. But apparently, when God writes it down, then we often see a lot less listening going on. That is why it is critical to define what truth is, and to actually use it. The only truth we have is the Word of God, thus When it comes to correcting ourselves, there is only one way to accomplish this, by auditing our beliefs against the Word of God, not against books, people, ministries, denominational creeds, or any other artificial head covering that we might place over ourselves. We are to only have one head covering, and that is our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ, or Yeshua in first century Hebrew, who is the Word in the flesh, who is the Word of God and is the same Word of God today, yesterday, and forever. In reality, Yeshua is a walking Bible. Whatever He did, taught, and practiced is the truth. The same truth that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And just to be overly clear, the Word of God that is the same does mean unchanging. Something that is the same simply means that it did not change. Now, we realize that we shouldn't have to emphasize that, but remember, some teach that the Word of God has changed. Is it not a problem to say that something is to be the same yesterday, today, and forever has also changed? If that is not a problem for you, then once again, this teaching will not be of any value to you. However, we suspect that most who are honest with themselves will not state that something that is to be the same has also changed. The only thing that has changed is our doctrines about the Word of God. And we have a couple thousand years of history to prove it. And in fact, we should begin understanding the intent and purpose behind this teaching. Often enough, we all fail to test ourselves and others to some degree. Not intentionally, but we all hold on to some untested assumptions. We all place more faith in others than we likely should, either because of their position or some institutionalized piece of paper that says they have some type of degree. We should realize that there is a reason why Yahweh says that He is against the shepherds in the last days and holds them accountable at His return in the day of the Lord. The pure water and pastures have been muddied and trampled, and as a result, His sheep have been scattered. Too many are placing blind faith in the shepherds that Yahweh says He is against in the last days. If it were not so, and we did not need restoration in the end, then He would not have said it. We have indeed been scattered and we do need restoration. The reality is, any untested assumptions are at risk of being in error. Let's consider the situation of the first century. In the first century, there were about a couple dozen distinct denominations in the faith, various positions on various things. 
The dominant sects were the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Pharisees had several denominations or schools under their umbrella. The Pharisees were the educated theologians of the day. They were the men with all the answers. They would have been the most respected and esteemed seminaries of the day. They taught doctrine that was hundreds of years old, passed down from generation to generation. They were the teachers, the leadership, the esteemed academics, the scholars. Their doctrine was supposedly tested by some of the most brilliant rabbinical minds for many generations. Even Paul subscribed to the mainstream Pharisee doctrine for a significant part of his life. In general, the first century mainstream Pharisees were also the Bible commentators and the Bible college experts of their time. All of that being said, according to today's established theological standards, we would expect that these Pharisee experts to have some rather sound theology. They should have been right. But few were challenging their interpretations of the Word of God. They were beyond smart. In fact, the top rabbi that Paul was training under, Gamaliel, required that a student memorize word for word the whole Torah, the first five books of the Bible. How many of us have memorized much of anything? They also had historical traditions and doctrines passed down from generation to generation from all the smart teachers in the past. They often call this the oral law, and many Orthodox Jews today refer to this as the Talmud. This was also memorized and practiced, and this, in fact, is where they got into trouble. They had all of the answers, and they were the esteemed go-to teachers of the day, and everyone knew it. And they claimed the Word of God is the truth, and if there was a question about the Word of God, you would go to them. But how did all of these things work out for them? Not so well. The reality is that this is the pattern of God's people in the Bible. Things start becoming a sea of religion and doctrines. All too often, we are taught that the Pharisees kept and taught the law of God as written by Moses. That is what the Pharisees taught and practiced, right? Jesus, again his Hebrew name being Yeshua, made some interesting comments about the Pharisees. Mark chapter 7. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to traditions of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, notice how Yeshua points to Moses, Honor your father and your mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, Whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is Corban, that is, a gift devoted to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. Notice he's connecting Moses to the word of God. And you do many things like that. Here we have Yeshua quoting Moses, saying that what Moses wrote is the word of God and is the law of God, and that the Pharisees nullified it in their doctrine and traditions. Their educational system, well-established theology, and esteemed mainstream leadership was in serious error. They had the Word of God. Yet in their traditions, doctrines, and practice, they completely nullified the Word of God. There are a couple things worthy of noting here. Number one, the mainstream Pharisees were obviously very wrong in their doctrine. This is an opinion that they are wrong. Yeshua clearly said so. Number two, Yeshua is teaching that nullifying what Moses wrote is a very bad thing. If Yeshua did not consider it bad to nullify what Moses wrote, then Yeshua would not have said that it was bad to nullify what Moses wrote. He does not say, do not nullify Moses now, just to later say, now it's okay to nullify Moses. That should make us wonder. Why did Yeshua spend his whole ministry teaching and calling those in error back to what Moses wrote? If what Moses wrote was no longer going to be of value and be practiced as valid instruction from God. If Yeshua gave us and practiced truth, is that not also what he taught? If Yeshua teaches obedience to what Moses wrote and he is our Lord, should we listen to him? Is what was considered wrong by Yeshua in Mark 7, nullifying Moses, now right? Is what was wrong before, now right? Can wrong 
become right? Did Isaiah not warn us of this? Isaiah 5.20 Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Yeshua was constantly trying to teach the Pharisees that they should practice the same word of God that they claimed to have faith in. The Pharisees said with their mouth that what Moses wrote was true and from God. But in their practice and in their traditions, they nullified it. Yeshua called that being a hypocrite. Mark chapter 7, verses 6 through 7. And he answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. He was repeatedly trying to teach them that the same word of God that Yeshua claimed to be in the flesh, the same word of God that is the same today, yesterday, and forever, is the same word of God that they should also practice. The word of God simply does not change. More often than not, for many of them, they simply refused to get it. They had the Bible in the flesh walking around and teaching them. Yet they refused to do only what Moses wrote as truth. And instead, they focused on what they wanted to do, not what God wanted them to do. John chapter 7, verses 19. Yeshua is saying this to the Pharisees. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Is what Moses wrote in our Bible too? Do we keep it? Is what was right now wrong? And was what was wrong now right? Do we do what Moses wrote? Do we believe it to be truth? Do we believe it to be a means of loving God and others? Yeshua said that we should do what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law teach, which is what Moses wrote, what they taught out of the seed of Moses. But Yeshua also said to not do what they practice, because they practice their traditions and doctrines that are contrary to the words of Moses they read from Moses' seat. Matthew 23. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, where they would read the Torah. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you when they're reading the Torah, the law of God. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Why do we not take Yeshua seriously here? Why do many of us continue to not do what was read out of the seed of Moses and do what the Pharisees did, which is nullify Moses in our doctrines and traditions? Just as Yeshua taught in Mark 7, we should do the word of God, not forsake or nullify it. He even calls them hypocrites because they preach the law, but they do not practice it. Some of the strongest words uttered by Yeshua for those who nullify what Moses wrote are reserved for those in Matthew 23. Yet we also nullify the same word of God in our doctrines and traditions, the same word of God we claim to have faith in, to believe in, to commit to. One of the worst things we can do is claim that we have faith in the word of God and practice and follow doctrines that are against the word of God. Yeshua said it was the same as lawlessness, the same as being hypocrites, Do we claim to believe, commit, and trust in the Word of God, but not practice the Word of God? Is Leviticus 11 and 23, for example, still the Word of God? Of course it is. Matthew chapter 5. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, Not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least. In Matthew chapter 5, Yeshua spoke of those who did not know that they were teaching against the word of God. They erred in ignorance. They will simply be least in the kingdom. But what about those who teach against the word of God but should have known better? What about those who preach and teach against the commandments of God, and they simply refuse to hear the truth? Matthew chapter 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, 
cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Notice the pattern yet? Lawlessness is the pattern. Lawlessness in Mark chapter 7. Lawlessness in Matthew 23. Lawlessness in Matthew chapter 5. Lawlessness in John chapter 7. Lawlessness in Matthew 7. Leading up to this point in Matthew 7, Yeshua spoke earlier about wolves. Matthew chapter 7. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Did you know that Scripture defines such terms for us? Trees are people. Trees are made from a seed. The seed is the Word of God. Trees produce fruit according to the instructions or the DNA of that seed. You can tell which seed is in a person, the Word of God or the adversary seed, based on what type of fruit is being produced. A Word of God tree simply produces Word of God fruit. It is actually quite a simple concept. But there is another term mentioned here, wolves. Have you ever wondered what wolves are according to the scriptures? And every symbolic mention of wolves in the Bible is about those who teach against the law of God, which is also against the word of God. They are the bad trees that produce bad fruit. But we did not need Yeshua to tell us that. All we have to do is read the instances of when wolves present themselves in scripture to see what wolves do, to see the fruits of the wolves. Here is an example from the prophets about the last days, entering into the day of the Lord, or the day of wrath. Ezekiel chapter 22. And the word of Yahweh came to me, Son of man, say to her, You are a land that is not cleansed or rained upon in the day of indignation, wrath. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured human lives. They have taken treasure and precious things. They have made many widows in her midst. Her priests have done violence to my law, Torah, and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the common. Neither have they taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they have disregarded my Sabbaths, so that I am profaned among them. Her princes in her midst are like wolves tearing the prey shedding blood, destroying lives to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have smeared whitewash for them, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, Thus says Yahweh, when Yahweh has not spoken. The wolves should have known better. They are the leaders, the shepherds. In fact, because of this, God says that in the latter times, He is against the shepherds and has to come back in the end to reign as the one true shepherd. Ezekiel 34. Thus says Yahweh God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths, that they may no longer be food for them. Consider reading all of Ezekiel 34 for the context about the day of the Lord, when he as David comes back to regather his sheep and reign in the land. As it relates to the law of God, there are many who are just simply deceived. They have not progressed to the point where they should really know better. They do not practice the whole word of God, nor teach it, because they are simply in error and do not yet understand that. According to Yeshua in Matthew chapter 5, Those are they who will simply be least in the kingdom. However, there are also those who should know better, but do not. They have been exposed to the whole truth, which is the word of God, yet have rejected the word of God. In the example that Yeshua had in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, we find that this group genuinely believes that they have salvation. But through their continued lawlessness, they showed that they really did not have faith in the word of God. 
Jude chapter 1. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. We simply cannot reject the word of God in our practice, but also claim to have faith and believe in it. We must remember that Christ is the word of God. We cannot deny the word of God, reject the word of God, and claim to know and follow Christ at the same time. It is an oxymoron. It is hypocritical. Christ is faithful to the Word of God because He is the Word of God. If we deny Him, the Word of God, He has to deny us because the Word of God says He must deny us. He has to be faithful to the Word. 2 Timothy chapter 2. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. If we are faithless, He remains faithful. He cannot deny Himself. Even if we deny the Word of God, deny what we have faith in, Christ maintains His faith in the Word of God because He is the same Word of God today, yesterday, and forever. If we were to deny the Word of God, which is Christ, and Christ did not deny us, then Christ would be guilty of also denying the Word of God. He would be denying Himself. Having faith in the Word of God, faith in the Messiah, is the only thing that affords us our free gift of grace. If we deny our faith in the Word, the grace goes along with it. It is a package deal. This does not mean that if we make a mistake or sin, we have fallen from the faith. What this means is that we cannot keep sinning and keep living as if the Word of God is not true and still claim that we believe the Word of God is true. Hebrews chapter 10. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment, do you suppose, will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We cannot claim faith with our mouth and deny the same faith in our actions. James chapter 2. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. If there is one verse in all of the Bible that should be taken more seriously, it is Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Those that should have known better will someday find out the hard way. In a very sad realization, that the same one that they call Lord, the same one that they did many works for, will claim to not know them. They even knew the name. They did works in his name. Yet he will claim to not know them. He will accuse them of lawlessness, exposing their demonstrated lack of faith in the word of God, which is Yeshua, or Jesus himself. This is why Paul said to test ourselves and our faith. We cannot forget that the word of God is the Messiah. And the Messiah is the Word of God. If we accept all of Him, then we accept all of the Word of God as well. It is a complete package, and we cannot choose which parts of the Messiah we like and want to know. So, we are to test everything according to that Word. Is it possible that there is theology in error today? Absolutely. The unfortunate reality is that Yeshua claimed that the traditions and the doctrines of the Pharisees was an error for nullifying what Moses wrote. Are there those today that are not applying what Moses wrote? What this series is going to attempt to show is that the traditions and doctrines of today are also an error for nullifying what Moses wrote. In essence, it is going to teach us or reteach us what Yeshua already taught us. What we see is established as a biblical pattern is that mainstream doctrine and understanding keeps walking in error despite correction. Has anything changed with this pattern? Is there anything new under the sun? 
Yet here we are today. Many teach according to tradition and denominational doctrine that what Moses wrote is no longer for God's people. For example, many would teach that Leviticus 23 and Leviticus 11 in the Word of God has been nullified and is no longer true instruction for us. Sometimes we are hesitant in admitting we could be in error. After all, how could so many people be wrong for so long? Well, if you are Protestant, we have to realize that the whole Protestant movement was birthed out of the realization that so many people were in extreme doctrinal error for hundreds of years. In fact, any Protestant is already admitting that nearly 1,500 years of doctrine was seriously wrong. That is the basic premise of the whole Reformation that took place. The Reformation certainly removed much error. We took one step, one foot, out of a rather corrupted religious system. But now, it is time to take out that other foot, just as Jude said before his warning in verse 4. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny our only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah. Just as Jude said, it is time to go back to the faith everyone practiced, the gospel everyone in the Bible had, even Israel at Sinai, Hebrews chapter 4. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, those who rebelled at Sinai. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. But did we stop our auditing of doctrines and traditions too soon? Do we still have some baggage that we have been carrying around with us? Quite simply, both the Bible and history teach that men, no matter how long it has been historically established, no matter how smart people are, no matter how many people believe in the same thing that they do, their doctrine can be just as unbiblical as the Pharisees. And sadly, just like the Pharisees, it can promote lawlessness. The only way that we can know that we are not in the truth is when we test what we believe to the only established truth. Yeshua is truth. What he practiced and taught was truth. Psalm 119, verse 142. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law, Torah, is truth. That is what this teaching series is about. There is a lot of doctrine out there that takes what Yeshua practiced and taught as truth. What Psalm 119, 142 says is truth. and says that those instructions from God Himself are no longer true instructions. In other words, the Word of God that Yeshua and every author of the Bible practiced is not for us and done away with. When the Bible calls the law of God good, holy, truth, the way, light, life, freedom, perfect, and just, you would think that God would still want us to have it as a way to live. What kind of God would take away something so good from His people? And what kind of people are we to claim that God did this and somehow that is a good thing? When I first all began to realize all of this, I was a member of a large Baptist church. When I began asking these kinds of questions, I was quickly connected with the adult Sunday school teacher. I asked him several questions over several weeks, and he was both quick and kind in his replies. Yet, I was not satisfied with his answers. He seemed to ignore or not understand what I was bringing to his attention. He never fully answered any questions, nor reconciled the conflicts, and would quickly point me to some other verse, usually Paul, citing busyness as his reason. Eventually, he just referred me to a book, The End of the Law, Mosaic Covenant and Pauline Theology, by Jason C. Meyer. I have come to learn that that title nearly says it all. It's basically all about Paul. There is no prophecy in the Old Testament that the law of God was going to ever change. That presents a problem in light of Amos chapter 3, verse 7. In fact, God said to never add to it, nor take away from it. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32. Yeshua taught and practiced the law of God as written by Moses. So we cannot cite our Lord for any change in the law. In fact, Yeshua said that not one jot or tittle of the law would pass until heaven and earth had passed. Well, Peter said that we are still looking forward to that day, and Revelation 21 describes that day in detail. It simply has not happened yet. The first heaven and first earth are both still here. 
So much for any jots or tittles of the law being removed. So much for any teaching that says that there are instructions from God that we are not to do anymore. You would think that not many would miss this. In fact, if Yeshua did change anything about the law of God, then according to Deuteronomy 13, he is to be considered a false prophet. Deuteronomy 13 was the test used to determine if a teacher was true or false. This is by God's own definition. Any teacher or prophet that teaches obedience to any other commandments in the Torah, the law of God, or the Torah has changed, either by adding to it or by taking away from it, he is considered a false prophet. This is why the verse just before Deuteronomy 13 says the following, Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take away from it. Assuming that Hebrews was written by Paul, which many believe, there is really only Acts 10, Peter's vision, and Acts 15 that are used to support a belief that God changed his law for his people. If you have not examined Acts 10 and Acts 15 as it relates to the law of God, and still believe those chapters can be used to support deleting parts of what Moses wrote as the Word of God, then we encourage you to study and test those chapters very carefully. For a more in-depth study on Acts chapters 10 and 15 on video and in writing, please visit us at testeverything.net. Once those chapters are reconciled, that only leaves us with Paul's letters. Nearly every supposed proof text that God changed his law for his people is related to Paul. Isn't that interesting? Even the title of book I was presented with basically esteems Paul and his supposed theology as the core support for the end of the law. Perhaps it is just me, but it is just a little odd that a book about Paul is called The End of the Law. Did we not note how many times Yeshua preached against lawlessness during his whole ministry, which he defined as being against what Moses wrote? Hopefully the first part of this series has done several things. It should be realized that the majority is not always right. Groups of God's people have been wrong about major things for hundreds of years before, many times before. If we have difficulty believing those things, then we must remove the whole Reformation and we might as all well go back to being Catholic. Everything should be tested to the Word of God. And that is our personal responsibility. We would be crazy not to. Perhaps you are beginning to question your understanding on whether the law of God has been changed or abolished. If you're not even open to that possibility and willing to test your faith and understanding to the Word of God, it should be again noted that nearly every defense of the law-abolishing paradigm or doctrine is founded on Paul's letters. In the next teaching in this series, we will introduce you to the Paul you never knew. We will even consult Paul's friend Peter and see what he has to say about Paul's letters and removing parts of the law of God. We will see what Paul said when he was accused several times of not teaching what Moses wrote in the record of Acts. We'll even begin examining some of Paul's letters and determine if he really did teach against the law of God. We hope that this teaching has blessed you. And remember, continue to test everything. Shalom.